software engineering involves a lot of decisions and the decision has some trade-offs. So we have pros and cons and so on. It's not like one decision is always better than the other. Sometimes you are not aware about trade-off at the decision time, but later, like after a year or two, this is costly. So maybe this cost could be alleviated. Hey everyone, my name is Henry Surya Wirawan. And you're listening to the Tech Lead Journal, the show where I'll be bringing you the greatest technical leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders in the industry to discuss about their journey, ideas, and practices that we all can learn and apply to build a highly performing technical team and to make an impact in your personal work. So let's dive into our journal. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Lead Journal podcast with me, your host, Henry Surya Wirawan. Thank you for tuning in and spending your time with me today listening to this episode. If you're new to this podcast, please follow Tech Lead Journal on your podcast app and social media on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Also consider supporting the show by subscribing as a patron at techleadjournal.dev slash patron and support me to continue producing great content every week. Speaking about software mistakes, I'm pretty sure that many of us have made such mistakes in our software projects in whatever shapes or forms. Or how about having to decide on important trade-offs to incorporate in your software design? And if you look back to those experiences, some of you who got them right will be patting yourself on the back for being able to choose the right solutions for your software problems. However, I also believe that a lot of us could point back in time and say, Yeah, I think I got that one wrong, and what a big mistake that was. Personally, I've made a number of those costly mistakes, and how I wish I could use some guidance that can teach me how to avoid typical and common software mistakes and trade-offs. Fortunately, our guest for today's episode has written a book just on that particular topic. Thomas Lelek is the author of Software Mistakes and Trade-Offs, How to Make Good Programming Decisions. In this episode, Thomas shared what led him to write this book and also shared one of his past software mistakes taken from his career experience. He also gave advice on how we as software developers should approach the potential software mistakes we could make and explain some trade-offs that we typically face when making software engineering design decisions these days, such as code duplication versus flexibility, premature optimization versus optimizing hot path, data locality and memory, And finally, different delivery semantics and their trade-offs in building distributed systems. There is so much to learn from Thomas about software trade-offs in this episode. And I hope you learn a lot from this episode as well. And if you do, help the show by giving it a rating and review on your podcast app or share some comments on the social media channels. It may sound trivial, but those reviews and comments are one of the best ways to get this podcast to reach more listeners. And hopefully, they can also benefit from all the contents in this podcast. So let's start our episode right after our short sponsor message. Are you looking for a new cool swag? Techlit Journal now offers you some swags that you can purchase online. These swags are printed on demand based on your preference and will be delivered safely to you all over the world where shipping is available. Check out all the cool swags available by visiting techlitjournal.dev slash shop. And don't forget to brag yourself once you receive any of those swags. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Lead Journal podcast. Today, I have with me someone named Thomas Lelek. He's actually the author of a soon-to-be-published book by many called Software Mistakes and Trade-Offs. So when we talk about writing software, most of the times, actually, yes, we do care about correctness. We do care about performance and things like that. But sometimes we also need to be aware of what kind of possible mistakes or trade-offs that we need to think about when we write software so that it performs based on the context that we want to build it from and also the business requirements and also in terms of maybe functional correctness and also performance. So today, I think Thomas will discuss a lot about this and hopefully we can learn from him about all the mistakes that maybe he has seen throughout his career or maybe some of the epic stories. Thomas currently works at Datastax, a company that built databases such as Cassandra and also a few other things. Yeah, Thomas, really happy to have you in the show. Looking forward for this conversation. 
Hi, welcome all. So Thomas, maybe in the beginning for you to introduce yourself, maybe telling us more about your career journey or maybe any highlights or turning points. Yeah, sure. So I've started in a shipstead company and it was like on the Scandinavian market where all Scandinavian people were reading our content. It was like newspaper and also websites providing news, but it was only 2 million of people and users. So that scale was not so big. So after that, I've progressed to Allegro. This is an e-commerce website here in Poland, the biggest one. We had 20 million of active users and there was a lot of interesting problems there, big data problems. We were collecting users' traffic and saving that for the future analytics, machine learning and so on. The data was like eight years or so. So there was a petabytes of data. So I was involved in streaming solutions, mainly using Kafka, also microservices architecture, that was fully microservices architecture with like hundreds of microservices. I think there was 700 of them and each of microservices was deployed to multiple nodes. There was auto scaling, also rolling deployment, all those patterns that are well known in this ecosystem. And also big data solutions based mainly on Spark because it's quite fast and has some advantages over Hadoop and, and those old solutions. After almost four years, I've progressed to data stacks because here we have a lot bigger scale. As you mentioned, we are providing ecosystem around Cassandra and some tools around it. Like for example, right now Stargate API that provides variety of APIs to our customers that could speak to Cassandra, but not deep directive via CQL, but also for example, gRPC, GraphQL and so on. Also I was involved in the Kafka collector. So it was based on connect framework provided by Confluent. So we provided a way to insert data to Cassandra and data stacks enterprise from Kafka. Performance was critical there for sure as well. So we needed to take performance considerations seriously. I was involved in some performance testings as well and so on. And main product was also Java driver. So the main entry point for Cassandra from JVM ecosystem, JVM world, also design trade-offs, interesting decisions that I was involved as a part of the team. So that's a summary of my journey. Besides that, I'm also a technical trainer here in Poland. So that's also an interesting experience because I can teach folks from different companies, but also I can learn from them, from their questions. By doing so, I'm better at what I'm teaching them. For example, Kafka or caching solutions, performance tests and so on. Thanks for sharing your journey. It seems like throughout your career, you have worked a lot with kind of big data problem, distributed systems, microservices, and also like optimizing to the low level. You mentioned about building like connectors, drivers, and things like that. So obviously you have seen a lot of different types of software, mostly are for high performance characteristics. But in the first place, why are you interested in writing a book about software mistakes and trade-offs? This is quite interesting because I don't see much of such book, except yeah, some anti-patterns, maybe there is, but in the first place, software mistakes and trade-offs, why do you want to publish this kind of a uh, book? Yeah. So from the beginning of my career, I've started noticing that software engineering involves a lot of decisions and the decision has some trade-offs. So you have pros and cons and so on. It's not like one decision is always better than the other, but of course you can have more than two options and possibilities. When I was involved in this variety of systems, in some business, strictly e-commerce systems, big data, streaming processing, and so on, the team tackled a lot of those decisions and trade-offs at different levels. So there were decisions at the low level, like code patterns, that's every software engineer needs to make them almost every day, but also more architecture decisions that you can like discuss with your team, which sprint or each two weeks, or even more high level decisions that will influence your evolution of your software, its maintenance, flexibility, also performance. During those breaking points in my career, when we choose one solution over another, I've started to writing a personal list of those decisions and how they end up, like from the time perspective. For example, how this decision impacted our software after one year, after two years, and so on. Because also I have pleasure to work with those systems, not only during the development, but also maintenance and when the system was deployed to production and I saw actual usage of it. After that, I've created this list of decisions. It was like 15 of them that were really important. And after some time, I saw that those forums are quite generic. So I decided to share it with other engineers, architects, and so on. So they will not make the same mistakes 
and they will be aware of those trade-offs because sometimes you are not aware about trade-off at the decision time, but later, like after a year or two, this is costly. So maybe this cost could be alleviated after you will read one of my chapters of my book. So it's interesting that you started this from like curating your personal list of decisions and trade-offs in your career. Maybe if you can share maybe one or two, the costliest mistakes that you have seen in your career based on this list. Yeah. Okay. So first one, and I'm touching on that in chapter 10 of my book. So we're building a streaming solution and we need some kind of a scheduling library, scheduling framework that will work efficiently. So we need to handle like 10,000 of requests per second, at least our system was distributed. It was based on Hazelcast back then. We picked one solution, one library without realizing all its trade-offs and without properly analyzing its source code. Because on the one hand, this library was documenting that it should work properly in distributed system. But in practice, in reality, it turns out that this is problematic. If you have multiple nodes, there were some problems with synchronization. The domain was totally different and the library was not well prepared for that. So this was cost to mistake because we needed to debug those problems. And then after some time, it turns out that this is a lot easier to just implement the minimum product that provides those functionalities for us, instead of using third party software that we didn't fully understand, and we didn't have enough influence on fixing that. So I think that was one of the mistakes that could be changed. That could be generalized to a fact that we should know the trading model of a libraries that we are importing. So for example, even if you have some non-block right now, there is a trend to implement microservices that works using non-blocking solutions like Letty or Node.js and so on. Sometimes if you are using libraries that are not well suited for that trading model, you may block your main threads for processing. It may turn out that it blocks your main flow and impacts your performance. So that should be found at the design stage. And also a different way around if you have quite simple flow that works in a synchronous way. Using an asynchronous library also you should be aware about problems that may arise because you need to be aware about ordering, about multi-threading. Basically when you are introducing multi-threading to your code, it means that you need to be aware of that and it means that you will have additional problems or maintenance costs. Maybe sometimes they may be hidden. Like for example, in chapter five, I have this example of Java Streams API and using parallel stream abstraction. So it hides the internal fork join pool that is doing processing in a multi-threaded way. So at the first class, at the code complexity level, there is no change at all. You are just changing streams, method invocation to parallel streams, but underneath you are creating a lot of threads and your code is multi-threaded now. I'm touching on that in two chapters of my book, basically. So as a software developer, I know that a lot of times as a developers, we tend to work based on just business requirements and, you know, just ensuring that the functional correctness, the input produces the correct output. So in your opinion, right, what should be the attitude of developers or software engineers in terms of looking at possible software mistakes and trade-offs? Is it something that they have to be aware since the beginning before they even write the software? Or is it like during the implementation? Or like, how should you advise for software developers to relook at all these potential software mistakes and trade-offs? Yes, yeah, so I think there are two different approaches to that. So first one is when you are picking some framework or library that will shape your code base and influence your code base a lot. So for example, in the JVM world, if you are picking Spring framework, it will influence your code base and will be hard to change it to something else in the future. Also, for example, if you are picking a Q solution and you are picking Kafka, you need to be aware about these trade-offs. It is favoring availability over consistency, depending on the settings of acknowledgements. With every distributed system that you are integrating with, you need to ask the same questions like how to influence consistency, availability, and so on. So for those situations, I think it's better to try those upfront. It is possible to know them upfront by doing good research and prototyping. On the other hand, there are those low level decisions like refactoring of the code and picking a specific pattern or design. In this situation, maybe it's better just to experiment with the code and compare like two approaches, right? So maybe it's not so costly to, for example, implement a solution using inheritance, but also implant another solution using composition. 
it's going to be even implemented by two engineers and then you can compare your solutions and pick the better one. So basically in this second scenario, the cost of experimentation is lower. So maybe you can postpone the decision about which one we will choose. And in the first one, the cost is higher because once you have this in your application, it's really hard to migrate. So it's better to read about it, educate about it and know those trade-offs upfront. So maybe let's go into some of the software mistakes and trade-offs that you covered in the book. Let's start with the first one, which is code duplication versus flexibility. Maybe tell us more about these kind of trade-offs. Like what do you mean by duplication versus flexibility? So I'm considering this problem in two ways. First one is at the architectural level. I would focus on that firstly. In the microservices world or multiple services, each service is responsible for some specific business domain, ideally, and contains some self-contained functionalities. So if you have, for example, two microservices, it is often the case that they may share a similar code in some way, like for example, authorization, set up the token and submitting it, or maybe some kind of a validation or things like that. So if you have this duplication between services, the first idea may be to just remove it and unify it using, for example, a library and use it in both microservices. But it also has a trade-offs. So for example, if you have the common code, you have a tight coupling between two microservices and this library. So it means that it may impact the evolution of your code base. Also, the fact that this code was duplicated at the beginning doesn't mean that it was the same functionality. Maybe they needed to evolve in a different way. In that situation, it will be really hard to evolve it because you will have some abstraction that is not fitting properly. All these cases, you will need to add additional content to the library, develop it and so on. And suddenly you have a tight coupling and also your flexibility of your software is lower. So you are not able to deliver your software as quick as possible. Other solution would be to just extract this new functionality to other microservice, but also it has other problems like additional network request, response time, additional latency, deployment that you need to create for this microservice and so on. So at this architectural level, sometimes some code duplication is not a blocker. For example, you have two components that are doing a similar job and you suddenly start seeing some abstraction in those two components and you are, for example, decide to use inheritance to reduce the duplication. Both components suddenly are dependent on this new component via inheritance. And the same situation can happen here as it may result that this abstraction doesn't fit the evolution of those two components. Maybe you decided to extract it too soon. And at this stage, it may be really hard to get back to the previous solution and have all those components independently. Similarly, you will introduce tight coupling and impact the speed of delivery flexibility of your code. I think this is quite a common case, right? Where as a software engineer, we are also kind of like taught. So you have to remove duplication. Don't repeat yourself. Dry principle. And also like when you see things over the internet, you have so many open source projects, they're basically creating libraries, frameworks, and reusable components and things like that. So we are kind of like taught in a way that, okay, duplication might not be a good idea. And also reusability is quite important. So in the first place, when we are tackling a particular problem, what is your advice for software engineer to actually relook at this perspective? Should you start with just a simple implementation first, then over the time you will see some kind of abstraction that could be built around that, or you should start seeing the abstraction in the beginning based on the particular context that you know, like what's your approach here? Yeah, I think the same solution is the second one, right? So we are not starting from the abstraction, but waste some time until it will settle out. So if you have a couple of components and they were living for some time, so we are quite stable state. So it's not a frequent evolution phase. If you see some abstraction, then it's a good time to extract it. At the beginning, you may be doing that too soon and it may be hard to unwind that. But there's also this argument that if you don't start earlier where you can reuse some of these stuff, it can also be costly in the future where you have to tweak your existing software, refactor it in order to make it more reusable, generic and things like that. So any thought around this? There is no simple answers here. Also, if you will go to the extreme, your code will not be good. But yeah, I think it also comes to the fact that you need to have a good test coverage of your components. So this is not excuse to not create good quality code. Also, you need to have uh, well-tested components. If they are well-tested, it's of course easier to refactor. 
but there are some functionalities that you can be sure that they will be reused. For example, some simple string manipulation, like what you have in standard SDKs, some connection to external systems and so on. Cool. So let's move on to the next trade-offs, which is what you call premature optimization versus optimizing hot path. Maybe the first term almost all engineers will be familiar with, premature optimization is the root of all evil, they all say. The second term here, optimizing hot path, what do you mean by that? Okay, so in chapter five, I will propose in your framework, if you have code that you don't want to prematurely optimize, how to make it early optimization or just in time optimization, how to have enough data to optimize it. So we need to have two things to make good decision, which code path you should optimize. So the first one is number of requests per second or some expected throughput on your paths. So assume that we have two endpoints. Let's say one endpoint is handling one request per second and second one is handling 10 requests per second. So having that data, you may be tempted to just go and optimize this endpoint that is executed 10 times per second. But it is not enough because we need to have latency data. So once we have data about latency, for example, we can get average latency for the first endpoint and second one. Then you can multiply number of requests at average latency and have a distribution of overall latency over those two endpoints. Having that data, you can detect the path that is executed most often. I'm calling it hot path. It means that it is executed almost for every user request. In the systems that I was working with, it was very often the case that they were following this Pareto principle distribution. So for example, like 80% of value was delivered by 20% of the code, or it was 10, 90, 30, 70, and so on. And that means basically that if you will focus your optimization efforts on a smaller part of the code, you will gain a lot of benefits. What I'm proposing there is how to detect this hot path. So this smaller part of code that optimizing will result in huge benefits and how to make this decision. So yeah, basically you need to have this request per seconds, measure latency, when you have the data, you can detect hot path and dig deeper in your code. So you can go to the specific parts of this hot path and measure each of those paths. And then you can focus on optimization efforts on a specific thing. It is basically a way to limit the scope of your work because in production systems, it is not possible to optimize every possible path. If you detect the hot path, you can make a rational decision. It is a place where you can do some additional efforts and they will really be worth it. After optimizing the hot path, it went to result that you will reduce latency so much that it is no longer responsible for it, most of the overall utilization on your system. But it may also turn out that still optimizing this hot path will give you better benefits than optimizing other paths in your code. Even if, for example, this first endpoint that was one request per second, average latency is, for example, 500 milliseconds, and the hot path is even 50 or 10. If you multiply that with this number of requests, so you have the full context, it may turn out that still is worth optimizing. Maybe a little bit of recap. So yeah, you should know the throughput of your system request per second, and also the latency of each of that request. And then you multiply it, get a sense of distribution, right? What's your P95, maybe your average, your maximum and things like that. Maybe a little bit of tips here, because sometimes engineers, when they write software, I don't think they have this in mind in the first place. What kind of tools or what kind of techniques that they should introduce to their software in order to get all these numbers easily? If your system have defined SLA, so if there is some kind of an SLA, it should state that your system should be able to exit some requests per second within specified light latency. If you don't have this data, then you need to measure it somehow. To get latency, you should write benchmarks that will validate your application. Yeah, so you can, for example, use Gatling tool, WRK tool. There's a lot of them, like Cassandra also has its own testing framework. You can, of course, use it to extract the latency. But there are a number of requests per second you need to have from SLA or from some product information, maybe what kind of traffic are you expecting? how the traffic will grow over time. So then you can adapt your tests and measure again. So sometimes also, I think these days people classify these things as observability, right? So 
having good monitoring or metrics as part of your software, maybe instrument your code base so that you can get this data easily, maybe even a profiler. Some tools these days, they can embed instrumentation code inside your code so that you can get these profiling statistics easily. So thanks for highlighting this importance about optimizing hot path. Let's move on to the next one, which is what you mentioned about data locality and memory. Maybe you can share a little bit more about this. Yeah, so, so in the big data systems, but also all data intensive systems, there is an important optimization that you should make. And all of those recent frameworks are doing those optimizations, but also they impact the way how the systems, big data frameworks like Spark, Hadoop and so on are built and some complexities in them. If someone is new to big data ecosystem, you may think that those complexities are unnecessary or is really hard to enter upon this high. But data locality means that you are moving your computations to data and not data to computations. What does it mean? So it means that, for example, if you have your data saved on multiple nodes, like Hadoop nodes, five system nodes, even database nodes, if you have some big data processing or processing logic, like for example, find the average of some value and your processing is on different nodes, then you are not fetching the data from the nodes or perform operations on the computation nodes, but you are serializing the computations and sending them to the data nodes. And sending computations is fast because they will not take a lot of data. This is basically serializing your Java, Scala, or other language program into binary format, sending it over the wire to the data nodes. On the data nodes, also some kind of an executor needs to be running to deserialize the computation and apply it to the data that is on the local node. It can be done in a distributed way, so multiple data nodes. Each of those is processing part of the data. And then there's another phase of coalescing the results. Sometimes this space involves sending data because, for example, it depends on the partition or partitioning scheme. Sometimes you need to send some data, but the amount of data usually will be substantially reduced if you will do it from the beginning, send the data at the beginning. That's basically as the simplest description of data locality, but implementation of it is provided within those distributed systems. And I'm focusing on Apache Spark because it's a recent technology that gives a lot of benefits over the old Hadoop-based technologies, mainly because it does a lot of processing in the RAM, not on the disk. The good example of data locality could be using the join operation. So if you are joining data sets and you have one big data set and second, maybe smaller ones, for example, you have a list of accounts and all purchases made by those accounts. So there will be a lot of purchases and number of accounts will be smaller. Leveraging data locality also would mean that you are making a same decisions, which data is sent to other nodes. In that case, we would send a smaller data set to the bigger data set to reduce this network trapping. In fact, it is called network shuffling. And that's one of the biggest that you need to focus when writing big data processing to optimize big data processing. But it can be also generalized to just normal applications, right? If you need to fetch some data, you need to ask the question, maybe it's better to tell other systems to compute that and send me only results. Also, the second aspect here is partitioning that is important and picking the proper partitioning scheme for your processing. So you need to optimize your partitions to your patterns. For example, if you need to analyze data per month, then it will be nice if one data node will keep the data for the whole month, if that's feasible. Then you will send a computation to this data node and computations will be local to the whole month and they could be executed in a local way. On the other hand, if you have data partition by, for example, account ID in that case, and you need to extract data for the whole month, it would mean that you will need to scan data from each data node, and then it involves network partitions. So yeah, I'm showing a couple of those examples in this chapter and how to basically help to pick this partitioning, depending on the processing that you plan to execute. So thanks for sharing all these details about how big data distributed system works, because I think like for small kind of data, normally people are not really aware of such trade-offs. But yeah, it makes a lot of difference if you are processing a lot of data and where you store the data, especially if your data cluster is large. So the thing that I pick up from your explanation just now, instead of sending the data to the computation, why not doing it the other way around? So you're sending the computation, which is your code, 
maybe you can call it the functional code, serialize it into binary and then send to the data, do some local processing there and just send the result back. Or maybe you do some kind of join and reduce operation, right? I think in terms of Hadoop paradigm map reduce, you basically send all these map operations to different nodes and then you reduce them and aggregate them into one possible result. So looking at this data locality, could you also actually apply this to like microservices, that kind of architecture pattern? Is there something around that or is this just applicable for big data? Yeah, I think it can be also, of course, applied to microservices. Microservices often need to fetch a lot of data from other microservices to create an end result for customer or maybe for another microservice. If you start noticing that your microservice needs to fetch a lot of data from multiple services and each service is returning thousands of records, and then you are just iterating over those records, filtering some subset of those records, or even coalescing it to the one result. Maybe that's a situation when you could send to the second microservice, just compute with this value and return this one value. In that case, you will reduce the traffic. The computations will be done on this second microservice and only the result will be returned. In that case, you will save network bandwidth and also processing CPU time and so on. So yeah, maybe a little bit on this, right? maybe some kind of a viewpoint because last time in a traditional way, we used to have this database thought procedure to process database queries and show that you can actually compute on the database node. But over the time, people move on from that strategy and actually put the application code, so to speak, like a backend API, right? Where you just query the data and you compute on the application backend. So what's your view on this? I think last time we used to do it near to the data, which is the database itself. Uh, maybe throughout the time because of scalability, because of maybe other considerations, people are moving away that kind of computation away from where the data is residing. Do, do you have any thought around that? The storage procedures had a couple of problems, mainly testing the stability of it, and also it could be very vendor specific. So you are coupling to a specific vendor and other problems. So the implementation of it was not ideal, but then the direction had some pluses, those trade-offs. And so you are keeping the computations on the node. As you mentioned, there is a trend to move computations back to the data and all the data frameworks are doing that, but they are doing that on a little bit higher level to provide some abstraction to not tie to a specific vendor. For example, in the Spark, it doesn't matter what format of the data you have. It can be Avro, Arcade, or high system, just plain text files and so on on Cassandra and database connector that provides the abstraction and all the logic is in actual programming language. So it's easier to test, easier to maintain. There are some pros of this approach, of course. Yeah, looking at the distributed data framework, I must say that it's also exciting. So I've used like Apache Beam, Dataflow as well, like Spark. I think there are lots of innovations around that. I'm really glad that some people are actually writing this kind of software so that as an end user, so to speak, software engineers, they just need to understand the paradigm and write the code appropriately. And let's move on to the next trade-offs, which is what do you call delivery semantics in distributed systems? So what's the importance of delivery semantics? Or maybe in the beginning, explain to some of us, what is delivery semantics? Yeah, so a system that you are interacting with gives you on the data. If it will be delivered once, at least once, it could be at least once, at most once, or exactly once, basically. If you are interacting with network call or any distributed system, then those delivery semantics are important for you. Even if you have two simple edge microservices and one is sending a request to the second one, there could be a network partition, for example, when the response get back to the first microservice. In that case, the second microservice accepts the data, process it properly, maybe save to the database. But the first service doesn't know what happened. And in that case, you need to make a decision from the perspective of the first service, what to do. We can retry the request. In that case, you will have a consistent view of the system if the request succeeded, but it means that you have submitted more than one request. So you may have duplicates and this will be at least once. You will deliver the message, but you could deliver it more than once. It gives a good guarantees on both systems. But it also has some problems because the second system needs to be prepared for that. So it means that there could be duplicates. You can design a system to be idempotent. So it doesn't matter if you are replaying the message, it will result in the same outcome. Like for example, deleting the value for a specific primary key may be idempotent because it doesn't matter if you delete it once 
or 10 times, it will be just deleted. But there are some operations that are harder to design them to be idempotent, like updating, for example, some counter, because there will be inconsistencies there. So we have at least once in that situation. If the consumer system is not aware of this, those duplications may result in the data, right? In consistent state. And on the other hand, at the producer side, you may decide that in such a situation, you are not betraying. But it also has a problem because the fact that response didn't come to the first service, it can also mean that it was not processed at all. There was a failure. In that situation, the first service will not retry and it may turn out that the second one didn't get the value at all. So it was lost at most once. So it means that it could be delivered zero times or one time. There will be no duplicates, but possibility for zero uh, delivery. Of course, as everyone can be aware, it can have problems because you may have lost some uh, data in transmission. There are some use cases that it is also good enough, like for example, collecting some matches that are collected every millisecond or something like this. And if you lost some of them, it may be not problematic. But lastly, you can have effective exactly ones because when the network is involved, you will need to make decision about retrying at some point. It can be done even at the protocol level, the CP layer and so on. So in effective exactly ones, basically you have this duplication mechanism hidden somewhere or some kind of a transaction built into your system. It's hard to implement. It has some problems, complexities, also big performance overhead. Usually you need to build it and be aware of that. Also, what's important if you have this microservice architectures, when there is multiple microservices connecting with each other, even if there's effective ones between two of them, the next one, if it does not provide effective exactly ones, there will be the same problems. So your whole pipeline needs to work in this way. So maybe just to recap again, there are three delivery semantics. So like at least once, at most once and exactly once. So from my experience in my career, most of the systems, especially the distributed systems, they will opt for the at least once delivery semantics, because maybe it seems like it's uh, much cheaper to accomplish. And also it's less complex in terms of how to guarantee that. So in your point of view, is it fair to say that for most of the use case, we should design our system using this at least once delivery semantics? Yes, yes, I think that's correct. We can remove the need for the duplication by designing our system to be item potent. It requires some thinking. For example, if you've got event-based system, it requires some thinking, but it's feasible. So for example, you can send the whole state instead of only updates. Like if you have the whole state, you don't need to do this counter updates, as I mentioned. So there will be no possibility of making your data inconsistent. So if you are designing your system to be idempotent, at least once it will work in a very good way. Also, you can build up the duplication mechanism. So for example, each event, each message can have some unique ID. It's going to be UUID and at the consumer side, you can keep just some kind of a table persistent map where you are mapping the ID to the fact if it was processed or not. But also it has its own problems because you may operate with distributed database that also may involve network partition. That's why this update of the fact that even was processed or not needs to be done also in an atomic way. But yeah, I have this in my chapter as well. In that case, you need to apply this modification on the database itself, not special the state, the state and to do some intermediate operations but it needs to be one atomic operation. So for example, compare and some kind of a compare and set on the database. And it's no SQL databases offers that as well. So you can implement that mechanism. Another thing that is commonly related to this delivery semantics is when you choose your messaging queue. I think maybe these days, a lot of messaging queue opt for at least once as well, but there are some products that offer different delivery semantics. Maybe from your point of view, any kind of thought what kind of messaging queue should people opt for, or maybe some kind of technologies that people should be aware of with all these different delivery semantics. In this chapter, I'm referring to Kafka because I have the biggest experience in this technology. Kafka is nice in that way that it can allow you to configure your producer and consumer behavior to work in either of those ways. You can have at least once, at most once, depending on your need. So then you can tune your settings properly, commit offsets in a proper way. And you can design your end to end pipeline to work in either of those situations. Because yeah, as mentioned, you can have use cases that are good enough with at most ones, but also some use cases when you have and you need at least ones. So using Kafka, you can have both of those. 
It's only the matter of configuration and configuring consumer producers properly. I have this in chapter 11 of my book. Thanks for sharing that. So for those of you who are interested in looking into more details about delivery semantics, make sure you check the chapter 11, in particular about messaging queue with Kafka and all the configurations that you can do. So Thomas, I think it's been a pleasure learning from you about all these different trade-offs. I'm sure as a software engineer, I hope we can all upskill ourselves to be aware of what kind of mistakes that could possibly happen and what kind of trade-offs that we should think in the beginning before we implement something so that we don't make costly decision that is quite difficult to retrofit or quite impossible to actually fix sometimes because when you have the data actually involved, right? Sometimes fixing data is not so easy. So Thomas, before I let you go, normally I have this one last question that I always ask for all my guests, which is to share your three technical leadership wisdom for all of us to learn, maybe from your journey or from your career. So can you share your three technical leadership wisdom? Yeah, so the first one will be leading by the example. If you want your team to enforce some specific standards, you should give an example. For example, if you want to have good test coverage, you should also do it. If you want to have a good description of your work, also you should do it and all that will follow. Is that a good direction? Second one, so it's always ask the question why. So if you are given to do something, implement a specific feature that will result in complexity, you should always be aware what value it will bring, if it gives you any value or not. What's the end-to-end -end flow of this new feature, how it will impact your customers and so on. So being aware of this, not only about the technical things, ask why we do even need to implement that. Because every code is a maintenance overhead and cost. So if you are able to solve the problem without code at all, then it will be ideal. And the third one is to create a blameless culture. So there, there is no blame of a single person. If you are doing sober and there was some error or failure on production, there are high chances that there was a problem of a process and not a single person. So it means that you should change your process, fix the process to not do the same mistake in the future and learn from the mistakes. So create some meeting, discussing how does it happen and try to incorporate that in that new process that will not have it. Thanks for sharing all this wisdom. I find it interesting, especially the second one, always ask why, especially if it involves some kind of a complex or a big kind of effort before you actually go down the rabbit hole and you realize, oh, actually it's not so important. Or oh, there's another alternative way where you actually don't need to write so much code. So thanks again, Thomas, for people who wants to reach out to you or learn more about the book itself, when is it going to be published? Where can they find you online? Yeah, so on LinkedIn, also Twitter. My Twitter handle is tomekl 7 And it's also for GitHub. I will respond to any questions, so feel free to ask them. Regarding book, you can also join the Manning Slack channel. This week, we have Book of the Week, and our book is Book of the Week. It means that everyone can ask any question regarding the book, and I'm answering them. That's cool, that's cool. So thanks again, Thomas. I wish you good luck with the publication of the book. So looking forward for that. Thank you for listening to this episode and for staying right till the end. If you highly enjoyed, please share it with your friends and colleagues who you think would also benefit from listening to this episode. And if you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe and leave me your valuable review and feedback. It really, really helps me a lot in order to grow this podcast better. You can also find the full show notes of this conversation on the episode page at techlyjournal.dev website, including the full transcript, interesting quotes and links to the resources and mentions from the conversation. And lastly, make sure to subscribe to the show's mailing list on techlyjournal.dev to get notified for any future episodes. Stay tuned for the next Techly Journal episode. And until then, goodbye.